Hey everybody, this is Brother Frank on the Remnant Call. Welcome to another episode. Glad to have you here, folks. I'm going to try hard next week to get this thing back to going on Thursday night like it should be. Uh, I've had a lot of work uh, to do with my company and uh, work at night, and it's just been it's been tough. And then if you saw the big exchange server hack for those that are in the IT world, uh, we had to spend night after night patching exchange servers all over the place because of the Chinese hacks that were going on. Folks, we live in a dangerous world. Your stuff is not safe on the internet. Let me give you a piece of advice. Keep your digital footprint low. Keep it very low. Put do not post pictures and stuff all over the internet of you and your family and everything. I know you like to share that stuff, but I'm telling you, make your profile very low. Why do I say that? Because folks, they are building databases. They are building digital DNA trails of you through the internet. And you might think, well, I use a VPN while I surf. Let me tell you what, folks, they can figure out who you are even through a VPN based on algorithms they use to find patterns in traffic searching and keywords. Because there's times when you don't have your VPN where they've been able to definitely tag that was you or you're on your VPN and you've logged in while you're on your VPN to your email, they can start figuring these things out based on these highly, highly uh, developed and evolved uh, algorithms that are out there right now within the artificial intelligence world. Listen, folks, I'm not making this stuff up. I actually know what I'm talking about. I am a network engineer. I've been doing this for years. I run a company uh, with a bunch of guys and we do network engineering. And I'm here to tell you, be careful what you do on the internet. If you don't want somebody to know what you're doing, don't do it. That's the easiest thing I can tell you right now. Keep your digital profile low. I can't stress that enough. The truth is, though, we are living in a time where people are forgetting how in serious the hour that we're living in. Just like when I say in your digital footprint and letting things, you know, not thinking about what we're doing and posting. It's the same problem we are running into in churches, in our own world, in our lives, uh, in, in our own walk with God. We are forgetting the important things of God. And when we re- relax on those things, We do things that we shouldn't, uh, maybe not intentionally to do harm, but we let our guards down. And once our guards are down, the enemy can come in. And that which used to be offensive uh, and wrong is now considered not so bad. You know, I've said it before on the show, uh, maybe a long time ago, when the Bible talks about the mystery of iniquity, he who now letteth will let. I believe that the mystery of iniquity, uh, you let a little bit, you'll let a little more and a little more. And before you know it, that little bit of iniquity will, just like the leaven, will leaven the whole lump. Don't give place to the devil to have a seat. We're going to open up the show. Let's pray. Father, in the name above every name, Yeshua Jesus, I ask that this show would be according to your will, your guidance. Lord, forgive me of my sins where I failed you, Lord. The things that I've done that have offended you, God, I repent. And Lord, forgive me when I have given the enemy of God a, a reason to scoff on my own behavior, Lord. I pray, though, that tonight that you would speak to your people, that we would once again value and cherish the holy things of God, is my prayer in Yeshua's name. Amen. I'm bringing this up because I can't stress it enough. How serious of an hour we live in. It's not only serious spiritually, but physically and everything else. Listen, I, folks, I, uh, uh, you know, there are so many things out there from uh, if you are investing, I don't know if you ever invest in the stock market. Uh, the stock market's all over the place. I have a friend, a uh, guy I know, um, actually, it's a client of ours, multimillionaires. Uh, he's divested himself of a huge portion of his income out of the stock market and into cash because right now he knows that there is so much volatility. Uh, if you've ever invested with cryptocurrency, yeah, it's a quick way you can make a lot of money. You can also lose everything. But cryptocurrency also is another indicator that we are moving towards a cashless society. And once we hit that cashless society, look out. I'm here to tell you, folks, you make a mistake, the government will just flip the switch off and you will be done. And I was talking to my father the other night 
And I said, Dad, I wonder if possibly the reason that they throw their silver in the streets one day is because it can't buy anything anymore because we've went to a cashless society. Listen, folks, I'm not saying that's the gospel truth. It just hit me when I was driving down the road talking to my father because silver and gold cannot save Cryptocurrency cannot save. A million dollars in cash cannot save. All the food in the world stocked up cannot save. Only Yeshua, Jesus, can save. And folks, I am totally against preparing for the last days when it comes to having some smart preparations. God, uh, I believe we're going to talk about that tonight, commands us. But if your faith is in your preparation, well, let me tell you what. They left the land of Egypt completely loaded. It said that they spoiled the Egyptians. They gave them everything they needed. And three days out of Egypt, they were already crying to head back home. Folks, I don't care what your provisions are. If your faith is not in the Lord, your provisions will mean nothing. At the same time, hear me on this clearly. Joseph had a plan. Noah had a plan. I believe we need to listen clearly to what God would be instructing us to do in this hour, but living in the faith that the flesh could save, well, let me tell you what, you'll be throwing your silver out in the streets because it won't buy you anything. Back in October 1962, uh, if you don't remember the time when they were running up against uh, the the Cold War there with the nuclear uh, war with Russia, you might remember something called the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I bring this up because... If you have ever done, like I've done a lot of work in different places, even some radio stations. It used to be the back in the day, radio stations all had to have a fallout bunker because of what had happened back there in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the threat of nuclear war was absolutely closer than anybody could have ever imagined. A U-2 plane, spy plane, took a wrong turn into Russian territory, and it almost, literally, almost ignited the war. It was so close. Uh, Most folks do not know that we were literally on the absolute brink of nuclear war with Russia. But the interesting thing is, now that we've read history, that people back then actually knew the threat was real. There's a house not far from me, a few miles away. They've still got an old bomb shelter in there and everything. People had shelters in there because they knew that the threat was real. But we live in a different time today. You know, back then, people understood the devastation of nuclear war. And they took preparations to prepare in the event that something bad happened. They built the bomb shelters, we said. They had food and things stocked up. Uh, The new evacuation routes that they were to take. And they had their potassium iodine and different things like that. Folks, you actually should have some potassium iodine. Just if there's ever nuclear war, uh, you you know, and you're not in the literal blast zone, you can actually take potassium iodine and flood your thyroid with iodine and help be a great defense against nuclear uh, Uh, fallout and everything and just you know simple little things like that but the reason they did it was because the threat was real and people took it seriously now the bible backs this up proverbs 27 12 a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself but the simple pass on and are punished the prudent man he sees something bad is going to happen So he does something about it. He hides himself. He gets out of the way. He removes himself from the threat. But the the simple, they they don't pay attention, and they end up getting punished for it. I like the way, you know, I'm a King James guy, but I like the way the New English translation actually says it. A shrewd person sees danger and hides himself, but the naive keep right on going and suffer for it. Isn't that a true statement? Basically, if you see something about to happen, it's a smart thing to take cover. Let me put it this way. If you knew a hurricane was coming, would it be a good thing to put some plywood over your windows? Uh, Duh, yeah. How about uh, if a flood was coming, maybe put some sandbags around your house? Yeah, those are normal preparations. And nobody would tell, call you uh, a crazy person because you took some of those preparations. You know why? Because they knew the threat was real. And when the threat's real, they know it's time to prepare. But right now, people don't see the threat real anymore. 
And so when you do prepare and you take precautions and you decide you really want to get your spiritual life in order, people see you as either some kind of a Bible thumper, a crazy person, or having fit, you know, just all kinds of weird uh, beliefs that you might have. You're a conspiracy theorist or whatever, because they don't understand that the threat is real. And if you don't believe the threat is real, well, there's nothing I can do to convince you. And the truth is, we are living at the last days. The truth is, we are living in perilous times. And we need to understand that the threat is real. Because when the threat is real, folks, people will prepare. Listen, if you know, knew that in one week, the Lord was coming back, this was it. It was over with. The Lord's coming back. It's all done. How would you live for that week? I'll tell you what, you'd be weeping and wailing and crying out for your sins. I'm telling you nonstop for seven days straight in a row. I guarantee it. But because we have time, it's not so important. And I'm looking around today and I'm seeing all these things like the cryptocurrency moving to a cashless society, a government who is trying to ruin our definition of what a man and a woman are and cause everything to be hate crime and everybody's a racist and everything we do is, 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 is as a believer and Christian is evil and everything they, they do is evil is now right. And we are living in such a sadistic society that now our enemies see us crumbling before the world because our president, if you look into his eyes, the man's dead. Have you seen? his eyes he's got dead eyes there is a deadness it's it's weird if you look into it and they see our weaknesses and folks they've been looking they've been playing the long strategy they are looking for our weaknesses so that when our guard is down when we keep giving all the money away and the people are f- relying on the government i'm telling you what i remember the words of demetri dudeman when he spoke about the attacks that should come folks if you haven't uh, read any of brother demetri dudeman's prophecies uh, you need to go back and read those uh, we had a program uh, back on the remnant call a few years ago about it. Folks, I'm telling you, the judgment on America is coming. You need to check that stuff out if you haven't ever read it before. But we are living in a time where not only that, but we're the largest exporters of pornography in the world. Children are in rebellion to the, against their parents. They believe in absolute wickedness out there in the world. And, 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 and it's the gospel of ET, of extraterrestrials, actually is more important today than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, people are more interested in aliens and the unknown than they are in the Lord and Savior. And they are not only doing that, but folks, have you seen the actual news lately in trying to prepare pre- uh, prepare us for this alien invasion this uh, that we've made contact. This is all a part of the devil's plans. Folks, do I believe there's something out there? Yes, it's demonic. It's the devil. It's the things we know of the gospel of uh, the God. The Bible has warned us about of these supernatural things that are going to happen and the deception that is coming in these last days. And folks, if we don't get grounded in the truth, well, I'm going to tell you what, we're going to be in big trouble. And so I'm looking at all these things that are going on, and I have a lot of friends that are believers, and they're going to church, and they're going to churches that won't even sing. They won't even sing this day and age because they're afraid that they're going to blow COVID out of their mouth and infect all their people. They won't even sing in church. And let me tell you right now, when you won't sing, you die. When you don't praise, you die. Folks, don't ever stop singing. I don't care if you can't sing. You can sing to the Lord. Praise music. God God developed godly music way back in the day, long before we were here. Praise has been around. And true godly praise will always be a part of our relationship. But churches won't even sing because they're so... I mean, what is wrong with the fear that is running over still today? The panic in societies is ridiculous trying to tell us to go take vaccines. I'm not taking one. Uh, You know, all these things. And then still wear your mask. It's about controlling and demoralizing us. Yes, they want to demoralize us by keeping on those masks that you are a nobody, just like they do in the Islamic world with over in Iran, where they cover the women's faces to where only their eyes are showing so that they can demoralize them as a people that they are worth nothing and not valuable at all. It is absolute madness. And you see all this stuff and you're wondering, why aren't people preparing? 
Why aren't people taking their relationship with God seriously? Not only physically, folks, am I talking about, but especially on the spiritual side. And I find it funny that those who yell the loudest at people who say physical preparation is a lack of faith are spending no time in their spiritual preparation themselves. Have you ever noticed that? Oh, yes. They love to say it's a lack of faith because you do any physical. Yet I ask, you know, it'd be nice to know how much actual spiritual preparation are they doing themselves uh, on their own? because all they can do is seem to criticize. But if they were to actually if they uh, were to actually would weep and to cry out to God and would see the state of this society, they may not criticize you so much. You know, the funny thing is, and it's not funny at all. Actually, I shouldn't say it. scratch that. It's not funny. The truth of the matter is that the time we are coming into is so incredibly intense that God talks about the way we should be reacting in hours like this. It's in Ezekiel chapter 9, and I want to read it with you here tonight, starting in verse 4, or excuse me, verse 3. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, In mine ears, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary." Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Now, folks, I want to tell you, this is one of the most absolute serious sections of the entire word of God. This is so serious because what Ezekiel is being led by the Lord through the spirit of the living God, when God's talking here and he's recording it, he's saying, I want you to go out to the angel with the ink horn. He says, I want you to find everybody that sighs and cries and weeps over the abominations, the wickedness that are being created. God's saying, I want you to find some people that share my heart in this hour, that see the evil of the nations, the evil of the society, the evil of what's going on right now, and they are brokenhearted and they are weeping because what's going Going on, I want you to mark them because those are the people that share God's heart. Those are the ones that understand the gravity of the hour that they are list- that they are in right now. But he says, for those that are not, huh? He says, slay them all, slay them all. God is looking for people in this hour that are willing to share His heart. Because his heart is broken over the wickedness that is going on in today's society. And people, I know they want to go back to normal. They want to go back to their church services as they used to be. But let me tell you what, folks, many of those things you want to return back to are just like returning back to the land of Egypt. Because if you've been sitting idle in your church pews for years and you haven't gotten out and shared the good news with somebody, you're just wanting to return back to the comfort of the place that you've been, but you have never actually followed the gospel commission to share the good news. Folks, maybe you shouldn't be back in your church pews. Maybe it's time to actually get out and do something and make a difference in somebody's life. Now, I know there are godly pastors and godly gatherings and churches that I'm not criticizing everything. But a lot of people want to go back to their normalcy because their normalcy means comfort. And the Bible said that God is starting at his sanctuary. And I'm telling you what right now, folks, I'm not so sure how many people he's going to find today. You know, when you understand the symbolism of the sanctuary, and that's a whole nother topic out there to study and to understand of what goes on at the sacrifice, the place of worship in his temple, that is the place we should be every day worshiping the Lord, eating, you know, from the table of showbread, you know, uh, you know, praying with the altar of incense, you know, filled with the spirit of the living God, the menorah and all those things. We should be living daily in his sanctuary, but people are not anymore because in the sanctuary are the holy things of God. So we look at this verse in Ezekiel 
And the question still remains, why? Why in this hour does it seem to be such a fog over God's people in the church? I'd like to call it the fog of Babylon. It's a dangerous fog because it comes in and it puts people to sleep. And the fog of Babylon is blowing through all of the sanctuaries and churches today around here in the United States. And yes, there are those that are not, but I'm telling you, a vast portion of these pastors who live based solely on the tithe, then they can't say anything that is of a word of truth because they might offend the fog of Babylon to where they don't even want to sing because there's such a sense of fear that the worship of God is of less value than of keeping the governor's command in their own state. You know, it's interesting, looking at the book of Judges. You see, Judges had a reoccurring theme without throughout its book. I mean, I love the book of Judges. To me, it's like the WWF of the Old Testament. If you ever grew up watching wrestling, yes, I'm, you know, I'm one of them old country boys, you know. I grew up watching wrestling and everything and yeah, I know it wasn't real, but don't tell me that when I was little. But it was wild, you know, in wrestling and I look at the book of Judges and it's the same thing. But there's a theme that goes in the book of Judges and I want to read here in Judges chapter uh, 17 uh, starting in verse 1. You might be familiar with this story. And there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest and spakest uh, of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it and his mother said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Now, this is interesting. He starts out in the verse saying, oh, yeah, you remember all that silver that you said was uh, not blessed? Uh, It was cursed. I I took it. And she's like, "Uh, blessed be thou of Yahweh, Lord, my son. That's interesting. She once calls it a curse, but now somehow it's okay. There's something not right going on here. Verse three. And when he had restored the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had holy Uh, dedicated the silver unto the Lord for my hand, for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. So he gives his mother back the silver and she says, oh, don't worry. I've dedicated this unto the Lord, Yahweh. That's what she's saying. The God of Israel, that you could make a graven image. Hold on a second. We just broke the Ten Commandments there, didn't we? No graven images. We're going to make a molten image And then so verse four, yet he restored the money unto his mother and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah and the man Micah had a house of gods, plural, and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest in those days. There was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So here we have what is a religious idol against the very word of God. But because they said it was for Yahweh, somehow in their minds, they justified it as being right. He made his own breastplate. That was wrong. He also made a teraphim in, in the house of God. He had a teraphim. And he made his own son a priest. You can't just do these things on your own. God had a certain way of how, how these things were to be done, and it's only so Certain people were to be priests. Actually, they were only out of Levi. And out of Levi, they had to come from Aaron specifically to be a priest. But there was no king in Israel. This was before Saul. And they had already rejected God as their king. But it's the closing verse that makes the most sense to me. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes did that which was right in his own eyes. You see, it reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 4 when it says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing 
and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they keep to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So here, uh, Paul uh, is writing with Timothy to Timothy, and he's saying here, listen, there's coming a time that it's going to be just like back in the days of the judges, when every man will do that which is right in his own eyes. They don't want to hear truth anymore. They just want to hear the lying fables that they have been told. And so with that, now they can adjust their service, their belief, their worship, their gatherings, or how they do it to fit their diabolical version of what it means to be a believer in Yeshua. And the problem is this stuff is being spouted all over the internet, even on Watchmen's channels. I love those Watchmen who love to just cuss up storms and do all that stuff that it's okay to just sit there and swear and be a believer because it's justified anger and so you can bless God from one side and you can swear out of the other and you can say all kinds of crazy things of what it means to be a believer in this hour and people will take it as gospel truth because they don't read the Bible anymore. They don't read it anymore. The, it said specifically, there'll come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Don't you understand, folks? That is the truth. That why the deception comes in the last days, when God says, I shall send them strong delusion, that they will believe a lie. Okay, God doesn't send the lie. He says he he sends the ability to believe the lie. And the reason, it's not because he wants you to believe it, but he says they no longer love the truth. So God says, fine, if you don't love the truth, you can have the lie because that's what you really want. The people are acting completely religious. They talk, they talk, they love to partake the things of God. The only problem is they don't want to do it God's way. Everybody has a justification of why I don't need to obey God. I don't need to keep God's commands anymore. That's Old Testament. Why should I? Hey, listen, if you don't think you should keep God's commandments, then I guess it's okay to go out and kill. You know, covet thy neighbor's wife. I mean, go ahead. I guess, I mean, that's, if you don't need to keep his commandments anymore, then I, I guess figure out which one you want to break first. I'm sorry, folks. The holy things of God are holy. And we need to remember that they're holy. They love to talk these religious things to make them comfortable to their ears. Don't tell me I need to change. Oh, I love that one. God loves me just the way that I am. And oh, like my friend told me the other day, the new saying is you're not sinning. No, you're not sinning anymore. You're just swimming against the love of Jesus. I mean, what kind of diabolical thing is that to say? You're just swimming against the love of Jesus. It's a way to make you feel comfortable in your sin by not calling it what it is. God loves me just the way that I am, which folks, let me tell you right now, I believe that. But he loves you too much to leave you in the place that you're at. God will accept anybody, I believe, no matter where they're at. But he loves us too much to leave us in that place. Otherwise, why would there be such a thing as deliverance? If God intended you to just live a lifestyle forever and never change, then why would he have a deliverance ministry in the word of God? The problem is that the people that call themselves believers just don't care anymore. They may say they do, but their actions speak otherwise. People don't care about the truth. I mean, I was talking to a pastor, and I had to to call him out on something, actually. I don't, folks, I believe in respect to, to leadership and everything like that, but I had to call a pastor out because he had written an article in a magazine basically saying that how could he you know, believe that how could somebody be convicted of the truth or he say something's true if the Holy Spirit hasn't convicted that person of it. He was talking about homosexuality specifically. Basically that how can we we come down on someone if if the Spirit of God has not convicted them, then who am I to say that it's wrong? Folks, I'm going to tell you right now, if it's in the Word of God, it's truth. It is absolute truth. 
And whether someone is convicted by the spirit of the living God, it doesn't matter because the truth will always be the truth. Listen to me carefully. I believe in a loving, compassionate God. I believe in his love and acceptance wholeheartedly. But the love of God leads people to the cross where Christ takes the old man or woman and creates a new creature, a born-again Christian or follower of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to spread the good news of Jesus. You can love someone into heaven, and folks, I'm going to tell you right now, you can love them right into hell. Look, God is calling us as believers to care for our fellow man with compassion and love. But we are to also care about the truth, and the truth is in God's word. None of us have this thing all figured out. But when we read God's word, we want the truth to be what resonates in our life. Listen, I understand we all come to understandings of certain truths at different stages of our lives. I actually believe personally that God lets us understand things in stages for our own good. Because too much, we could condemn ourselves. I mean, sometimes I believe God is gracious and allows us to understand uh, when we are ready. But that doesn't change the matter with truth. And it doesn't change the fact that when you've believed one way your whole life, and you might think you're, you know, something's going to happen a certain way in prophecy that makes you feel good, that you won't have to suffer any tribulation. And all of a sudden, the truth you're faced with seems to disagree of what's going on. And now you are reading the truth. But you know what? I like the old way better because it makes me feel comfortable. But the word of God actually says this folks, you need to make a decision. What's better? The truth or your feelings? It's the truth. It's the truth. Paul said it right. There's coming a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. They will not live by God's truth anymore. There is nothing we can do to stop the world from doing that as believers, folks. But Paul gives us the charge when he was said there in Timothy, he said something else, to preach the word. That even though they were doing all these things in 2 Timothy 4, 2, he said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort it with all long suffering and doctrine. Paul's saying it doesn't matter that they're not listening, that they're not doing the right thing, that they don't care two hoots, that they've called you every crazy thing. You are to preach the word of God. And don't forget, though, to also be long suffering. Don't forget to be passionate or compassionate, I mean. In verse 5, he says, watch. We need to be ready for the coming of Jesus and endure sufferings. There is a price to be paid for following Jesus. People will hate you, but he says, do the work of evangelism. Paul is saying, don't give up, even though the truth is has been thrown in the streets. Even though no one cares about psalm doctrine, preach the word. Back to the beginning of this message tonight. In the 50s and 60s, people prepared for nuclear war because they knew the threat was real. Today, folks, the threat is even more real than it was back then. It is even more alive than it was back then. Not only is there the threat of nuclear war far greater and outweighs anything that happened back then, but the full swing in the churches of America of leaving the truth of the gospel and going to now fables of their false idols and calling them from God, the truth is being thrown in the street and confusion has fully set in. This is the devil's plan for the last days and we don't have to be a part of it. If you're struggling with sin, the key to victory is not manipulation of the word to justify your sin. It's not telling yourself that you're simply swimming against the love of Jesus. The key to victory is to get into the word, get into prayer, and separate yourself from the things of this world and start focusing your attention on God. Stop fighting and battling your sin and begin to focus yourself upon God. The living God. He will in turn deliver you from the sin. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all things shall be added unto you. Quit adding everything first and then seeking the Lord. God says, seek him and he will take care of the rest. If you've got a sin problem you want to overcome, stop directly fighting your sin. Start seeking the Lord with all of your heart. He will overcome. I don't care what you did before you heard this program. I'm not here to judge your past. I want to tell you right now, I have as bad a past as anybody. I want you to know that no matter how bad the problem is, our God is greater and able to deliver. Listen, folks, I have spoken at churches all over the place. And when I have shared my conversion story of my life of drugs and violence and everything and how God saved my life in one hour of one day, I have had people come and tell me things uh, that would blow your mind. But you know what? You're not going to shock me. You're not going to make me go, oh, I can't believe you did that, folks. I know what it's like to do those things. I lived it. I did it. Drug abuse, adultery, pornography, lying, stealing. I've done everything, done them all, did them to the fullest. I've been there. And I'm telling you right now, our God can save, heal, and deliver. Only thing God wants is you to finally be honest with him so that he can deal with the weakness That's why he calls us to surrender. The threat is real. It's time to prepare. Jesus is coming, and the truth of God must be our foundations. No excuses to justify sin will ever free the sinner. Low lack of prayer time will prepare us for the second coming. God has more grace than you have problems, and he is looking to deliver. The question is, do we want the truth? Do we want the deliverance? Or do we want to live in our fables? Last week, we had the serious cyber attack from hackers in China come upon Microsoft Exchange servers all over the place. And we were patching like crazy. And it reminds me, though, of when we had the great WannaCry uh, virus that broke out, the WannaCry ransomware that happened. It was crippling and debilitating. It was scary for those to think that in one moment your data could be locked out and your business could be wiped completely if you didn't have backups that were not hit. It, folks, it hits people's backups, ransomwares do now. You need to make sure, you know, if you have a company that your backups are in a location that cannot be touched on your network. The scariest thing, though, was the realization of just how far our systems and how fast they can be disabled and brought to a crash. If this would have gotten into our power grids here in the United States in the past in some of these ransomwares, it would be a matter of hours and our lives would be changed forever. Vehicles would stop trucking, things would be shut down, our stores would be empty, and we would be put into the Stone Age in a heartbeat. Shipping stops. You think you can just go to the grocery store? No, it will be unlike anything you ever said. And we keep always looking for an EMP. Folks, I'm telling you right now, an EMP could hit and shut the power grid down, but one ransomware, one crypto locker virus could hit hard enough and shut it down the same way. It doesn't have to come from above. It can come from within and it will bring us to a stop. Do you see how volatile our world is? And knowing this could happen in businesses, do you understand the eternal ramifications of what happens when you decide to walk away from the Lord? What happens when you decide that you don't want to make that commitment to Jesus? Do you understand the internal ramifications of what it means to be separated from a, for a lifetime from your Lord and Savior? You think that a ransomware, you think that step breaking an arm, you think that drowning is bad? Wait till you understand the flames of hell feel like a place where God doesn't desire anybody to be, but it will be horrible. But God is trying everything to, in this last days, wake us up. I close with this wonderful verse from the book of Joel. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Folks, God is about deliverance, but he's asking us in this hour to take his holy 
things as holy and to be prepared. Prayer, fasting, seeking his face. This is the hour. Stop putting it off. In a moment, your and my lives can change forever. We don't want to be caught off guard. This is Brother Frank on the remnant call, imploring and encouraging and, and begging each one of you to stop waiting. This is the moment. Now is the cry. Begin to seek your God. Good night and shalom. Trumpet in